Warm welcome one and all to the second day of the International Interdisciplinary Virtual Conference on Environmental Humanities Relocating the Territories of Nature. To waste, to destroy natural resources, to skin and exhaust the land instead of using it so as to increase its usefulness will result in undermining in the days of our children the very prosperity which we ought by right to hand down to them amplified and developed. This caution by Theodore Roosevelt only makes us to cry to the Lord to grant us the wisdom to care for the earth and till it, help us to act now for the good of future generations and all his creatures, to help us to become instruments of a new creation founded on the covenant of his love. To take this prayer of us to the Lord Almighty, here comes uh, Mr. Edwin Moses to offer the opening prayer for the day. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this good day. We thank you for all the blessings you have showered upon us, Lord. We thank you for this international virtual conference on environmental humanities. We thank you for giving us this fellowship, Lord. Thank you for your guidance leading all through the first day of the conference. As we are in the second day of the conference, we commit the entire proceedings in your hands, Lord. We pray for the speakers of the day, Mr. Dr. Orion Glendaluz, Mr. Theodore Baskaran, and Dr. Arnachalam. Bless them and bless their family. We once again thank you for this fellowship, Lord. Thank you for this coming together. Let this be a beginning to such interdisciplinary conferences. Make us transform us stewards of this planet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, sir, for the ardent prayer. Let God shower his blessing and grace throughout the day. Sustainable development is the pathway to the future we want for all. We need to preserve every facet of our environment. It is priceless and means the world to us in terms of the benefits it offers us. The only caveat being, we never know when our environment would cease to do this favor to us. We are already feeling signs of it happening. Faithful stewardship is the need of the art to save ourselves. We are moving to the special address three by Dr. Orin Jindalus, environmental activist, professor of biology and environmental studies, University of Michigan, Dearborn, USA, on the topic environmental stewardship. To introduce him to the August gathering, may I invite Dr. A. Relton, a passionate environmentalist, wildlife enthusiast, and a thorough professional social worker to do the honors. It's over to Dr. A. Relton, head Department of Social Work, Bishop Buck College. Good morning and thank you, um, Shalini. Um, it is an official uh, introduction about uh, Dr. Orin and uh, welcoming the uh, gathering for today's second day of the International Virtual Conference. Uh, we know that it's an interdisciplinary camp, um, conference. It's the first of its kind in, uh, in the campus. Uh, my appreciation to all the organizers for the same. Uh, I take this opportunity to welcome all the participants uh, for the day two program. And I am also happy to welcome uh, the two important uh, plenary speakers of the day, Dr. Orin and Mr. Theodore Baskaran sir. Uh, for uh, going to talk about or share their expertise with this. I take this uh, time. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Oren, who is a very good friend of mine. Um, we know each other for the last 30 years. And um, uh, we, we started as a very uh, simple way, and we are now great friends. Dr. Oren Jelrelus just retired as a professor of uh, uh, environmental studies and biology from the University of Michigan. He did his BA in biology in the Calvin College in the Calvin University, then MS biology in Western Michigan University. Then his PhD in environmental biology in the Western University, Illinois. He started his career as a school teacher. Then he moved on as a director of a summer camp for eight years. Then he started his uh, college teaching in the department of Michigan University. 
he has a 50 years of teaching experience from 1969 to 2019 and he still advise to advise graduate students in the university he is a excellent bird watcher a field biologist and uh, he is very much interested in environment and conservation he is the one who started the environmental education program at the university of michigan by establishing a environmental interpretation center which is a very very popular center in detroit usa uh, that center runs for more than 40 years even some of our faculty from bishop bieber college had an opportunity to visit the environmental interpretation center even one faculty went up to doing her phd in environmental education because of the impact she had at the environmental interpretation center uh, arun is a very popular person in uh, the town of uh, dearborn um, and detroit uh, because of his um, conservation activity he developed a, a model called windshield uh, uh, ecology right so you you must some of you must have heard about this term windshield uh, because when we travel at night time we see a lot of insects hitting the windscreen but last few years if you see we don't see much insects hitting the windscreen of the cars or buses so he thought there is something happening in the environment and he popularized that uh, issue and it has become very very popular not only that you know he is very good uh, or very much interested in saving the waterways and rivers uh, there is a small river in the, near his campus called roof river where he developed a Uh, formed a committee and uh, the people of detroit were able to clean that particular river and that particular stretch of river is now used for various fishing and uh, boating activities so he did a very good service to the town where he was uh, living and so the uh, local government awarded him a green leader award of michigan in 2010 so his conservation activities does not stop only in usa but he had some activities in india as well many of you know about karavetti bird sanctuary which is one of a popular bird sanctuary in tamil nadu which is located 40 kilometers from trichy that actually that uh, work was done by bishop bieber college under the leadership of dr arin when he visited uh, the lake for the very first time uh, the forest department of tamil nadu has only 28 bird species in the list but that day we came out with a long list of birds close to 60 birds we found out there are a lot of birds in the sanctuary so he got some funding from asabal institute for us to do a systematic scientific study of birds so we did that survey for two years even he participated in the uh, survey couple of times uh, very interestingly one day when we all went for bird survey we spotted four greater flamingo which was not supposed to be there which is actually a coastal bird which lives in seas and oceans which was reported in the lake so we gave a paper report saying that four great flamingos reported in karavetti lake and dr arin and his team of students from usa were there next day there was a batch of police officers in bishop bieber college talking to that principal uh, jagar chalara sir asking why the foreigners are here looking at the birds a uh, very interesting connections but after that you know at the end of the study we found out there were 204 species of birds at karavetti and we submitted that report to the government of tamil nadu which ultimately declared that lake as a bird sanctuary so his services of conservation extends from us to india as well thank you arin for that then now at presently he is a um, having member of various professional services he is in the board of trustee of calvin college he is still the board of directors of the friends of the roof river in michigan uh, he was the board of trustee in asabal institute later became the chairman chair of board of, board of asabal institute through asabal only uh, or in got introduced to bishop bieber college uh, i still remember the connections uh, professor swami raj uh, made with the, uh, dr orin long long ago i think it is in 1993 or something like that he just walked into his office and met dr arin and invited him to come to bishop bieber college uh, to start 
uh, international program between Bishop Eber and Asabal Institute. Arun took it very seriously. He landed in India the next year. And um, then we started a faculty exchange program where um, uh, Jagger Sir, Edison Sir, um, Moses, uh, even um, myself, uh, Daisy, and many people went there for training. Uh, Jagger Sir became a part-time teacher at Asabal Institute. Then in 1997, we started a program for uh, North American and Indian students to study uh, the ecology of the Indian tropics. So every year, Orin brought North American students to study about Indian ecology along with Indian students, which I was a part of it. Uh, there is a privilege for me to teach a course with uh, Dr. Orin for last 25 years. And we did that course uh, more than close to 1,000 students got benefit out of this program. Uh, that why, that's how, you know, Arun is very close to Bishop Bieber College and to many of us at Bishop Bieber College. Um, apart from that, you know, Arun is a very good Christian. Uh, he goes to church every week and he preaches and he practices whatever he preaches. Even this, uh, just before this uh, official talk, I was talking to him about few things, you know, he was telling tomorrow he's going to the university in his bicycle. So he never stops only by preaching, he practices. He goes to the university by bicycle, even if it is minus 18 with four feet of snow, you can still see him bicycling. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not only a practitioner, he helps others also to practice. When I landed in his house in 1997, somewhere in May, uh, it's a summer for us, but that is a winter was not that time, you know, it, they had an extended winter. So Arin gave me a bike early in the morning and said, come on, Relton, we'll go to the university. You know, I am from tropics. Uh, May, probably the temperature in India was around 35, 36 degrees Celsius. Uh, I was exposed to already eight or seven degrees Celsius, but I was asked to go by a bicycle. I enjoyed that, right, brother? Um, but <laughs> it was definitely too cold for me. So he's a preacher as well as a practitioner. Apart from that, he wrote a book called Eco-Theology. Very excellent book. So today his topic is stewardship. So we cannot find a more suitable person to talk about this topic than Dr. Orin General Lewis. So I with this introduction, I present to you Dr. Orin General Lewis, um, environmental activist, former professor of Environmental Sciences and Biology from University of Michigan, Dearborn, my great friend, Dr. Audit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosen, for your gracious introduction. Can you hear me and is my slide on the screen? Yes, we Thank can. You. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be associated with you and your family in Bishop Heber College since 1993. You have been an outstanding leader for many students from Bishop Heber College and the colleges and universities in North America in our studies of the environment of South India. By way of self-introduction, I can tell you that I live in the United States in the northern part in the state of Michigan in which the lower peninsula is shaped like a mitten. On its western shore uh, of the Lake Michigan, uh, Professor Jayakar stood on the top of the sand dune and he assumed that all the water that he could see, which he could not see land on the other side, was marine or marine, as you say. Uh, the University of Michigan Dearborn is located on the former estate of Henry and Clara Ford with many habitats on it. Of course, you know Mr. Ford as the manufacturer of uh, of uh, 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 the uh, the uh, mass manufacturer of automobiles. I was privileged to teach a field of biology in this area, as Relton said, for 50 years. We enjoy the spring migration uh, in which the leaves burst from their buds and the insects have fresh salad and the warblers have fresh protein to energize their migration. The fall colors are really spectacular and we just celebrated the 20th anniversary of our Environmental Interpretive Center. 
I appreciate your recognition of the esteemed colleagues who have contributed to the backdrop of our conference and to the expression uh, expansion of the interdisciplinary territory of environmental stewardship, as you see their names here. I also appreciate the expectations of the conference in which to relocate our territories of nature and expand its horizons beyond the disciplines of natural sciences. I hope I have captured the essence of what you mean by the title. I hope the same for a stewardship expansion. In fact, the meaning of stewardship has already been expanded. My recollection from my younger years is that the only meaning of stewardship was financial stewardship. That meant we must be sure to share our money with the church, our Christian school, and those in need. And that was the practice of my parents. Adding the title environment to stewardship was a welcome expansion that came about a half century ago. Now I appreciate the addition, additional push of this conference to extend it further in our educational system. Stewardship is exercised by stewards. And the definition of a steward involves the use of a noun or a verb. The definition which is appropriate for us is as a verb, which means to manage or look after another's property or stewarding nature. Well, for whom does the steward steward? Obviously, the creator. Suppose you wanted to apply to be a steward of nature. What would your requirements be? First of all, you have to have a deep knowledge of the creatures of which you are serving a steward. Drs. Relton and Daisy both qualify as stewards of South India. You're going to have to know the creatures and, and their needs. Again, both qualify as stewards of South India. We're delighted to have spent a lot of time with Ralton and Daisy uh, stewarding. You also have to, if you want to be a steward of the planet, uh, you have to have the greatest challenge of all time. You will need to know the needs of 5 million and 30 hundred and, and three, 5 million, 300,000 to 1 trillion species. Clearly, we do not know the number of species on uh, our planet and the populations that need to we keep, be kept happy. At the same time, we have to uh, take care of the, our, the creatures of the planet and we have to know their lifestyles, their vulnerability, the nutrients, habitat constituencies, and many more factors about the property of air, water, and cycle, and sunshine. And the days that I spent with Dr. Ralton and Daisy from the Bay of Bengal to the biodiversity of the hotspot Western Ghat, we were overwhelmed and could not record the number of the species that we observed. So we should probably pause for a few minutes to consider the magnitude of our responsibility to be stewards of the earth with its enormous complexity. I hope that our reflections should lead to a feeling of humility and away from any sense of arrogance. To pray, pray, paraphrase Jesus' comment on the Sermon on the Mount, even Solomon in all his glory and wisdom could not fully comprehend the lids of the field or the birds of the air, which Rob Relton will tell you about with a motto on his vehicle. Another requirement of students is that they must know our human consumption levels of the earth. As an indicator of the awareness of the impact we already have on our world, I give a student a survey on the first day of class and ask them, how much water do you use per person per day in your household? Well, the answers come back, I use five liters. That's all everybody uses in our house per person. Some say they use 75 liters per person per day. Well, I then have them record the, their household water meter amounts and the amount that they use each day for one week uh, period per person. I also have them review their water bills for the past year and, de and determine the amount of uh, water per person per day. The range is from 150 liters to 600 liters per person per day with an average of 300 liters per person per day. Thus, a family of four would use 1,200 liters of water per person per day. I'm not sure you can, uh, with me, imagine 
how much that is. Well, a steward has to ask the question about the sustainability of this process, especially when the water used goes down the drain and mixes with the sanitary water on the way to the world's largest wastewater treatment system. Most students, even environmentally student oriented students, have no idea that their wastewater and sanitary water is returned to our local river, not fully treated. Now, such information has to be standard knowledge if you're going to apply to be a steward. A second requirement for a prospective steward should be an awareness of the consumption of energy that you use per day. I require students to record their electricity and natural gas consumption for a week and also a year and report the amount of uh, calories and joules consumed. I then asked him, how would you reduce your energy consumption of electricity if you had, were required to do it by either 10%, 25%, or 50% in the event of a calamitous situation in which you had a major shortage of fossil fuels? Students will install low energy light bulbs, add an insulation in the house, we live here with a lot of snow and below zero degrees Celsius, lower the thermostat several degrees, wear heavy clothing, Unplug their TV set when it's not in use. Well, these changes may get them the 10% reduction. But when it comes to a 25 to 50% reduction, students did not realize that 75% of their energy comes from natural gas for heating. Only a few students recognized and admitted that they could not stay warm and have the same lifestyle in the same house. They would have to move out. A responsible steward will recognize how tenuous and precarious our lifestyle is. It depends not only on the supply of energy, but also the world political situation. Now, would you like to withdraw your application as a steward? How can a steward respond to all these environmental uh, uh, pressures with a limited knowledge and expertise? I'll describe another classroom exercise that sheds light on our steward's dilemma. On the first day of class, that's before the reading the syllabus and telling them when the exams are gonna be, we worked in small groups of three to identify topics and issues as possible in about 20 minutes. These are the real issues with which Earth still must deal. Collectively, with 50 issues on the board, and here they are. How do you go about solving each one of these issues? Well, typically we use a traditional or classical environmental problem solving approach, which unfortunately is a tunnel vision approach. First of all, the scientists recognize that they have a problem and hazards uh, each of these 50 uh, issues of water, air, and soil and disappearing species. We bring the issues to the attention of the public and the lawmakers. We pass laws to prevent pollution or to restore habitats. We establish enforcement procedures, and we hope that the problem will be solved. Using this tunnel vision approach with such an issue is overwhelming and frustrating because each of these issues has its own interest groups uh, and uh, lobbyists who oppose the, uh, the, the, their change in regulation. Uh, stewards will become weary at the slow pace of improvement while well, other problems become exacerbated. Thus, how could stewards deal with 50 issues and probably a thousand issues? They would recognize that there are proximal issues and ask what the ultimate issues or underlying causes are behind these proximal issues. Thus, the second assignment is to go home and uh, identify three to six ultimate issues behind these 50 proximal issues. In other words, what are some root causes or ultimate issues of this tunnel vision list that will never end and cause a drive, the cause or drive these issues. In the second class period, the students reassembled in the same group and shared their ultimate issues. Year after year, from these 50 issues, the students generated similar ultimate issues behind the proximal issues. Invariably, the results were myopia, historical amnesia, greed, arrogance, ignorance, 
And of course, the problem of tunnel vision. Well, talking about myopia, we, this is short-sightedness. It's in our DNA as part of our fight and flight for a short survival. We live in the short world. We have a 24-hour news cycle. We have, in the United States, elections every two years, four years, and six years, and then it's over. And if you don't do something in six years, you're not going to do anything. We cannot detect the increase in global temperature, even though it's rising, and we can't detect that because of the lack of, because of our myopia. We cannot think about the impacts of climate change, uh, but we can't think up to 2050. A steward must be concerned about issues on time scales of ecological time, which include the forever chemicals, depletion of groundwater, the time to restore forests to full biodiversity, and the oceans to be full of sea creatures. Historical amnesia means that we forget the lessons learned in the past. We forget that these events have happened decades ago, such as floods, droughts, earthquake, and tsunamis. We're going to take our chances that we're not going to be harmed. Thus, it's a challenge to be able to live in our society and remember the past while we consider life for the future generations of our children and grandchildren. How do we solve the problem of greed and selfishness? We are bombarded with incentives to consume more and more at the least expensive price. Where is a vaccine to overcome greed and substitute frugality and joy and happiness of relationships with care, compassion, and concern for others? A quote from James Gustav, known as Gus Beth, he was a top US advisor on climate change. He talks about greed. He says, materialism is toxic to happiness and we are losing our connection to the natural world. Well, we believe that's true. How do we live with arrogance? The arrogance expresses ourselves in the attitude that we think we know it all and have all the answers. We are proud of the accomplishments we have made by restoring populations of plants and animals from near extinction, such as the Indian, Indian flap turtle, Indian flap shell turtle, and the American bald eagle. Yet, we, we think we know everything and we celebrate our restoration of plants and animals from near extinction. But we find that 30% that of the birds in the US uh, have declined. We have fewer insects hitting the windscreens of our vehicle as Rel Rel Relton mentioned. Uh, and we have found that uh, the fireflies, which are the luminescent beetles uh, that graces our gardens in the evening have decreased. These declines may be due to pesticides and practices that were intended to be safe. But whom do we? But, but for whom are they safe? Our pride and our arrogance causes us to ignore the precautionary principles, which are to establish a policy to determine that a project or activity will do no harm to people or ecosystems. Instead, we go ahead and say it's not going to matter. The principles should be effective even when some cause and effects are not fully understood or established scientifically, we should not promote a project. The, promoter, promotion, the proponent of an activity should bear the burden of proof, not the public. A full disclosure should include alternatives to a project. Uh, examples of avoiding the, the Precautionary principle means that we have wide use of pesticides in agriculture, which affects our health and humans of all ages in health, all health conditions. We um, avoid precautionary principles and inadvertently, inadvertently introduce new species in the ballast water of international shipping. Again, a quote from Dr. Feth is appropriate. He said, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss ecosystem collapse and climate change. I thought that 30 years of science and would address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. The same things our students realize the second day of class. And to deal with these, he said, we need a cultural 
and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. A similar statement of confirmation comes from India's first premier, first prime minister, Mr. Nehru. He said, it is now clear that science is incapable of ordering life. Life is ordered by values. Okay, now whose territory are we gonna reassign the cultural and spiritual transformation assignment? Well, one of the things we can do, I think, is start living with humility. If arrogance is one of the ultimate problems of the environmental issue, and if the mission of colleges and universities are to lead in solving our problems such as arrogance, should we uh, develop a curriculum that includes a major in humility? Can we relocate our humanities, philosophy, social and behavioral disciplines to integrate values and beliefs and to understand how our world functions? This may be the ultimate issue, uh, help with the ultimate issue arrog uh, and of arrogance and deal with many problems scientifically, uh, simultaneously. When it comes to ignorance, this too is an ultimate issue. Is more education with facts from science gonna help? Well, <clears throat> we're not robots. We have spectacles of values and beliefs. Witness the deniers of climate change who have different values and don't believe in it. Can we ro relocate our traditional problem solving practices to humanity, humanities and the social and philosophical uh, disciplines? <coughs> Clearly we need to relocate these problems involving science to territories other than science. How does a steward or grand challenge <clears throat> solve grand challenge or wicked problems. <clears throat> These are characteristics of challenges or wicked problems that we have. No one person or agency is responsible or accountable. These issues have no clear uh, problem definition. The issues are socially complex. Multiple stakeholders are involved and they have conflicting agendas. Problems and solutions straddle organization and disciplinary boundaries. Solutions are not right or wrong, but better or worse. So do you still wanna be an environmental steward? How do you solve these problems? You don't. <coughs> you try to mitigate it. The first to shift the goal of action on a significant problem is to go from solution to intervention. Instead of seeking the answer that totally eliminates a problem, one should recognize that actions occur in an ongoing process and further actions will always be needed. In other words, it's an iterative process or what we call adaptive management. A comment from a, one of our heroes and Edward Wilson in the uh, Harvard University said, we are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. The world henceforth will be run by synthesizers, people able to put together the right information at the right time and think about it critically and make important choices wisely and relocate and, and uh, relocate our thinking of nature. My comment is that we need stewards who can put the world together instead of only dealing with our own territory and taking it apart in our silos called disciplines, departments, and programs. My name for this process of putting the world together is called a liberal education, in which we become liberated or free to learn, work, and explore outside our so-called major, outside of our job description, and to think outside of the box. Let's take an interlude and discuss some terminology about the world that we are stewarding. Our behavior on the planet is vital for, uh, um, and I'll take a, a, an interlude here um, uh, with, the, with the word environment for the world in which we live. Our collective, co our colleagues are um, in your heroes list is Wendell Berry, an American author, farmer, poet, and outstanding writer. 
he has some pungent and pithy comments on the term environment. The idea that we live in something called the environment for us, for instance, is utterly preposterous. This word came into use because of the pretentiousness of learned experts who were embarrassed by the religious association of creation and who thought world too mundane. But environment means that which surrounds or encircles us. It means a world separate from ourselves, outside ourselves. In other words, it means the other. Wendell Berry said the real state of things, of course, is far more complex and intimate than interesting than that. The world environs us, that is around us. It is also within us. We are made of it. We eat, drink, and breathe it. It is bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. It is also a creation, a holy mystery, made for it to some extent by creatures, some by no means by all of whom are humans. This world, this creation, belongs in a limited sense to us, for we may rightly require certain things of it, the things necessary to keep us fully alive as the kind of creatures we are, but also belong to it. It, make, it makes certain rightful claims on us that we care properly for it and that we leave it undiminished, not just to our children, but to all the creatures who live in it after us. None of this intimacy and responsibility is conveyed when we use the word environment. Personally, I use the word creation. Unfortunately, the word creation has been a victim of word piracy. The debate between evolution and creation has isolated us with two pirated words. No matter if one believes in the world was created in, in a long uh, and began and continued to be created, uh, we as humans with a, con a conscious need to be exist and a thrive in it and respect it and honor it for the processes that it created. It is a, if it's of any interest, anyone, I believe that the, the word creation describes a world better than environment because it sends a message of dynamic, organic, fruitful, and ever-changing world which is the process, which is in the process of being created. Why is created? Why is it created? It is a medical metaphysical process. Furthermore, I believe a creation steward has a goal of developing a sense of wonder, as described by one of our heroes, Rachel Carson. So, what is a proper way for a steward to relate to the creation? Our behavior on the planet is vital and crucial for our long-term survival. We have a long history of viewing the world as ecologically rather than ecologically. For a first view of creation, we see it as a collection of commodities. That's elements of the earth that can be sold for a profit like oil, fish, whales, and so on. Here are the top 14 commodities of the world that we are selling. These have been given to us, but we make money from them. Well, how do different people see a tree? Well, they see how many pieces of wood they can get from it and how much lumber, or do they see it as a masterpiece of creation? We sell water for a profit, and, and commodities, we see the whales of the ocean, and we think of those with dollar signs or rupees. We, make, uh, uh, we, we sell bottles of water in plastic bottles that are made from uh, another commodity, in other words, um, uh, fossil fuels. These whales were slaughtered in Antarctica for, for oil lamps and the populations have never recovered. Check the populations of whales over time. How long will it take for copper to be more, which was formed in this landscape to be replaced? This world, this view of world as a commodity is part of my country's founding practices and heritage, and it is not sustainable. How do stewards relate to the community? A second way is a vast supply of resources for use by humans as food, shelter, clothing, and transportation. And here we have the water, soil, air, nutrients, wind, sunshine that we use for 
re as resources. Water provides energy for food and, and is, it is used but not abused in this case. We use wood for fuel, whether we collect it in a forest here or whether it comes from a prosopis shrubs. We use our river resources into which we discard our water. We use the atmosphere to deposit our burned materials with health damaging particles that cause serious health problems and cause our climate processes to change. We soil for, use soil for growing food, sometimes in a stewardly manner and sometimes not. The land is a resource now for depositing most of the 3.5 million tons of garbage per day and the rest goes into the ocean, another resource. Ron Klaus Schwab, the founder and executive chair of World Economic Forum, which meets in Davos Cluster in Switzerland, described our atmospheric resource as follows. The economic boom of the past 75 years came at a high price. Almost all of the carbon budget the world had to avoid catastrophic warming is now used up. In other words, the atmosphere is full of CO2. If we want to avoid even a two degrees of warming, the next generations, both in the US and around the world, will have to either stop leading the energy consuming lifestyle of their parents or Western peers altogether, or come up with clean alternatives in less than a decade. Viewing the world as commodities and as resources as we currently do, does not coincide with our definition of environmental stewardship, that is to care for nature. This is far from our practices when we see the world. A third view of the world comes from the description of a more recent star in our list of stewards. If you do not know her, let me introduce you to her. She is Robin Wall Kimmerer, an ecologist at the State University of New York in Syracuse. She's a member of the Potawatomi tribe of first people of our continent. Her book from which I will draw my comments is entitled Braiding Sweetgrass. Dr. Kimmer describes a living and the non-living world as a gift from the creator Sky Queen. How does the world of gifts compare to a world of commodities and resources? I grew up believing that commodities and resources were legitimately up for grabs by the first come, first serve, and get them while you can mentality. Now, what do you suppose you would do if someone gave these to you as a gift? A ripe jackfruit uh, picked in a state of perfect ripeness or baked a birthday cake in your honor? Would you see these as a commodity and part of the market economy? Would you immediately think about how much money you could get for it if you sold these items? I have received many gifts, uh, uh, many fine gifts as representative of India. And as you can see in over my right shoulder, uh, there's one of these, uh, which is a, a peacock, uh, beautifully carved. Uh, and they represent uh, the fine gifts in my memories of, from Bishop Heber College and the friends. But what would you think of me? If I accepted these gifts with a great display of gratitude and said, this would make a very useful fuel, fuel for my barbecue quit, my barbecue grill. Obviously, you wouldn't ever want to see me again. When we receive a gift, we give sincere thank you to the giver. In addition, we will likely return the favor and give something of the giver that we know he or she will like. As a result, we may enter into a relationship with the giver and become a friendly neighbor and a coworker. Thus, we will have a relationship of reciprocity. Can we even imagine in a thought experiment, a world that is, is a world of gifts? is a gift of all creatures and processes of precipitation and evaporation and cooling, not as commodities or resources. We may see the hydrologic cycle as the greatest gift of all. For decades, we have been overwhelmed with the growth of a market economy of money and a world of commodities for sale and profit, or the resources for consumption without payback. 
According, according to Vaclav Smil, a Canadian economic analyst, who wrote the book, The Frightening Specter of Endless Growth. He claims our worship of the concept of eternal growth has become a religion and our obsession to get the economy back to normal will continue to liquidate the sale of our planet and continue to produce great inequities. I think a gift economy will be inhabited by stewards, practicing stewardship, who give back to the world what we, we, we got. In our current economy, we need to examine when taking our, uh, when, when our taking is outright thievery from the next generation or even the next seven generations as the first peoples caution us. In a gift economy, we do not have a bundle of rights as we feel in the United States. In a gift economy, we do not we, we have a bundle of responsibilities and our currency is reciprocity. About a hundred years ago, Elder Leopold said, we abuse the land because we see it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community or Dr. Kimmerer would say as a gift to which we belong, we will begin to use, see it as love and respect. To paraphrase Dr. Kimmerer, from the very beginning of the world, the species were our lifeboat. Now that we have entered the Anthropocene, we must be theirs. But do we know them well enough to save them? Are we humble enough to understand that we are part of their community and that we can communicate with them? Clearly, citizens view themselves as stewards of the world as a gift will take the, the, they will take their gift, the care of their gifts. Lewis Hyde is a scholar on the gift of economies and creatures with which we communicate. And he says, their world, that's the world of creatures, will remain plentiful because it is treated as a gift. We do not trash and toss out gifts. Although the concept of reciprocity and communion with non-human creatures may appear to be utopian idealism, I hope that in 100 or 200 years, we will be humble enough to have our minds open to major paradigm shifts, such as we had in the Copernican Revolution and the concept of the origin of species by means of natural selection by, proposed by Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. To me, the concept of the world as a gift is remarkable similar to the Judeo-Christian account of the creation. Again, the Potawatomi viewed the sky woman queen as falling into the darkness and establish a diversity of life on earth and give it the attributes of a gift to be treated with reciprocity. The first account of creation in Genesis also gives humans a great deal of responsibility for living properly in and with the gifts of creation. Humans were expected to follow their commission of dominion, but not domination, and charged to rule and respect justly and fairly as their kings were required. In the second account of Genesis, Adam, uh, can, the second account can be uh, uh, taken also from Genesis 2.15 to see as a gift. Adams, whose name in Hebrew comes from the word Adama, which means of the earth, just like humus makes humans, is, is given the responsibility to kill, till and keep the garden. Examination of the Hebrew words for, um, the, the, the root, for, for till is abad, which is a root word for to serve. In other words, to serve the garden with a life of service or con servants from the Latin. The word to keep in Hebrew is shamar, which translates as keeping for the good and for the benefit of that which is being kept, not necessarily for the benefit of the keeper. In essence, the keeper is a steward or trustee of the garden. Obviously, the garden keeper or earth keeper will benefit greatly, as will the garden if there is a relationship of recipro reciprocity. I think it is an eloquent interpretation of the meaning of the relationship of humankind to the creation in which we live. 
So what do we need for the future? We need a paradigm shift to relocate our territory or turf and become stewards. This is gonna be a fundamental change in the approach of underlying assumptions. We need to be prepared to make major relocations of our territories and the meaning of stewardship. We need to develop a vision of hope, not of despair, that, and, and we need to give up aspect that we need to give up aspects of our life that are destructive to the creation of future generations. We need to see, have expectations and optimism for creation stewardship, which include a stewardship society, which includes values of community, care, compassion, and happiness. We have to learn about the uh, creation and the stewards in our world that is more than the Solomon in all his glories. And we need to do this with, help, with the, uh, cooperation with all of the world of arts, humanities, and, philo and philosophies. I think we also have to give, think about giving consideration for personhood to non-humans so that we respect and care for them. The, Recently, and I think we also have to uh, consider the meaning and value of sacred as part of stewardship. Now, sacred uh, things may be elementary to many of you, but to Americans, nothing outside of a church or religious building or a cemetery is sacred. We have no sacred groves or annals which is adaptive to their preservation rather than to have them seen as commodities or resource. resource. Recently, I learned from an acquaintance that the Balinese on the island of Bali have two words for water in the historic Bali language of Bali Basi. One is uh, Titra and represents water as sacred. They recognize that water is limited supply and needs to be cared for. Thus water is made part of their religion, which is also called Tirta. The other word is Ayat, it looks like air and is a resource for using. So they have sacred water and water for use. We have nothing of the kind. So stewards, stewards face an incredible challenge to shift their economy from eternal growth, production and consumption to a circular society to coincide with the ecosystem economy and reciprocate with the creation. Another uh, major change, I think, is that we should uh, develop a society of reciprocity with the creation. One of these changes is uh, a paradigm shift is to take a stewardship oath. And this comes from Hippocrates and his oath, in which he says, I consider for the benefit of my, I would say, the creation and abstain from whatever is destructive and degrading with purity and holiness, I will pass my life in practice. With dedication and commitment, I will practice my life and profession as a steward and a trustee. Into whatever habitats I entered, I will go into them for the benefit to restore the integrity of the habitats and demonstrate care and concern for the health of all the creatures in the creation. My relationships with humankind and the real world will be for their benefit and not for my personal gain. And so we say at the very least, I will do no harm or in Latin, primum non nocere. And then uh, Hippocrates said, we, well, I continue to, while I continue to keep this oath unviolated, may it be granted to me to enjoy the life and practice of the art of earth keeping, respected by all humans in all times. But should I trespass this viol or violate this oath, may the reverse be my lot. Well, I hope that this is something that we can decide as a paradigm shift to take an oath as stewards. Finally, I think we should consider the contemplation of what is the purpose of the creation. I will conclude with thoughts written by an acquaintance, Dr. Larry Rasmussen, a social ethicist at the Union Theological Seminary in New York. He says, early on when time and earth were yet young, 
they all gathered around dawn. The dragonflies and blackbirds, the Swedish ivies and the Boston ferns, but they weren't yet sure about Sweden and Boston. The Tyrannosaurus rexes and the duck-billed platypuses, a lion and a lamb, a woman heavy with child and a shy young man, and of course, the elder among them, Venus, the morning star. They waited. They all waited to see if it would happen again. With growing impatience, they waited, and they waited ever so long. Finally, it happened. They broke into applause, grabbed one another by the arm or wing or frond or whatever, did a joyful jig, sang a funny sounding song. It had really happened again. The sun had come up one more time and in almost the very same place. Morning had broken, just like the first morning. As was now their habit, they elected a village philosopher for the day and retired to the daily session of the primitive theological brunch bunch discussion group. It had only one question, and that it loved to contemplate. Why is there something rather than nothing? And the glow of the astonishing experience, the rising of the sun, stayed with them all the day long. But soon grew some soon grew bored. They quit coming to the regular mid-morning discussion group with this one and only question. They quit gathering at dawn. Some claimed an inalienable right to sleep. Soon they quit applauding and dancing and singing. There were other things to do, like toil, reap, cook, complain, invent aspirin, suffer ulcers and coronators. God continued do doing only wonders, but no one noticed. They would wake up alive, but fail to be astonished at that. See one another, alive and well but hardly let the mystery of it all register. They would eat and drink and kiss goodbye, breathing, laughing, crying, singing, working and dying. It all went on. God kept his doing, God kept doing only the wonders, morning like the first, but no one gathered to feel creation anew. They may even forget the question that they, that they love to contemplate. Why is there something rather than nothing? Thank you for the invitation to be part of your Relocation of Territories of Nature initiative. I hope that the next conference will be entitled Relocating Nature's Territories, Creation Stewardship. Thank you very much. Thanks a ton, Dr. Oren, for presenting us with practical tools for environmental stewardship. You facilitated us to gain insight who has deep knowledge of nature and has the greatest challenge of all time. You helped us to introspect on the day-to-day -day tasks we do, the process associated with it, whether it is sustainable. You encouraged us to go beyond our short-sightedness and to be a steward with genuine concern about time scales, spiritual transformation and relocation um, and relocate our traditional problems. It did touch us when you reminded us that humans uh, deeply have a responsibility for the creation uh, to have dominion, but not domination, to rule justly, fairly, and with respect. I'm sure we we'll all uh, would aspire to do that. Thanks a ton, um, Orin. Uh, it's now time for a Q&A session, and it's over to Dr. Shanti, Associate Dean of Arts, to coordinate the Q&A session. I'm sorry, I have a hearing deficiency and I hope that I will be able to understand the questions. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, sir. Thank you for your very powerful talk on stewardship, which focused on delineating the trajectory of emergence and development of different environmental worldviews with the help of various references you brought forth to make us understand the concept of stewardship more. 
and which mark the milestones in our environmental and ecological thinking. So um, there is um, one basic question which uh, comes to my mind when you spoke on stewardship. Um, probably before that, I could recall Glenn A. Love's um, call for a paradigm shift from eco ego consciousness to eco consciousness um, as a kind of revaluing nature. And thank you for bringing that very specifically in your talk. And the question is, nearly every verse and interpretation of the scripture on environmental stewardship alludes to Old Testament. How does New Testament offer a distinctively Christian contribution to environmental stewardship? Uh, if I understand the question, it was, how does the New Testament speak to environmental stewardship? Is that the question? Yes. Do I understand the question? Yes. yes. Nearly every verse and interpretation of scripture on environmental stewardship focuses on or alludes to Old Testament. So how does New Testament offer a distinctively Christian contribution to environmental stewardship? Okay. I, I still think you're, you said, does the New Testament relate to environmental stewardship or am I missing something? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. Oh, that's okay. Yes, yeah. definitely. Uh, the New Testament speaks to that. Um, uh, if, if you look at uh, um, Romans that talks about all things come together uh, in Colossians, uh, you'll find the text that uh, Jesus Christ is the ruler of all things. Now, that does not just mean uh, in, in, not just mean uh, um, people. Uh, in Hebrew or in uh, Greek, the, they have the they don't have a word for nature. Uh, they use the word tapanta. And that's the word that's used in Colossians. Tapanta means all things, uh, including plants and animals. And all things come together in Christ. Most of the time when I've heard that passage, I think that means all people. But all things are the, li the living and the non-living parts of the planet as well. Uh, and then also uh, we see that in Revelations, in the last part, in the last days, uh, the new earth is uh, the new earth that's going to be uh, there will have a, a river flowing through it and there'll be a tree planted an island in the middle of the river there that does not mean that all people are going to be taken into heaven and you're going to be there with streets of gold and no wheat fields or grain fields or rice fields from which we can uh, have sustenance so I think that uh, there are a view of that in the New Testament uh, it needs to be expanded from what I've learned in my uh, Bible classes and theology classes uh, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for that uh, very lucid answer. Uh, we were able to understand that. Uh, participants, uh, now it's your time to pose questions. Probably I'm prompting the questions. Please make use of the time when the resource person is available before you. Um, yeah. Uh, you can unmute your mic and you can speak, right? So, uh, sir, before we can put the questions, let me, let me uh, put a few more questions which I have in my mind. Um, how, how do we interpret the parables of Jesus Christ from eco-theological standpoint? Because the parables speak of only one dominant truth. It, they talk about the kingdom of God. How is it possible for us to apply eco-theological principles to, um, or the stewardship principles to the parables of Jesus Christ? I'm not sure I understand the question, I'm sorry to say. Um, I picked up a few words from it, but um, 
I don't know, Relton, can you repeat the question? Yes, sir. So how do you apply the eco-theological principles to the parables of Jesus Christ? Yeah. How do the ecological principles apply to? The parables of Jesus Christ. Be I'm, I'm sorry, I don't believe I can answer the question because it is, I, I, will, I, I will misinterpret the question, I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay, sir. Like. Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not doing very well at this, I, I apologize. Okay. It's okay, not to worry. I wish I, I wish I could be with you. Um, so uh, how, do you, how do you relate it? put the question in the chat. Oh, someone says here, oh, it is a chat question. No, it just disappeared. Um, uh, Just a minute, I think it's here. I thought I saw the question in the chat. Well, one of the questions here is, how do you relate to eco-theological principles to the parables of Jesus Christ? Well, I think that uh, Jesus talks about compassion and care uh, for the, uh, the weak and the, the lonely, the sick and the, the, the poor. Uh, and I think it fits right in with uh, all, all the creatures, all the living uh, uh, creatures of the planet. Uh, that was the whole point uh, behind it and uh, taking care uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, the, uh, the plants and animals as well. Uh, I think is, is part of the Hebrew tradition. So. Yes, sir. Um, okay. so there, is, there is one more question in the chat box um, where uh, it's been asked, will the gift of economy would save the future generation? Is it possible? Sorry. Um, well, um, yeah, that's the, that's a big thing. Is the um, is the gift economy is re reciprocity, and so then we will see that there's more equality among people. Uh, we will, if you reciprocate, you will see that there's the relationships between the plants. Again, there will not be commodities and resources, but that we will try to replace what we use and look forward to future generations, uh, I think that's necessary for the, uh, the, the, the future generations. Um, and I think it's much like, uh, why, why, why do we try to live a good life? Why do we try to not cheat and, and steal from people? Um, because it's the right thing to do. Uh, and that's what I think our worship services uh, are trying to tell us as well. So I think the gift economy is a way, way to go, and we've got a lot of work to do, and it's not going to be simple. Professor Oren, greetings from uh, Gideon. Gideon. Hello, Gideon. Good to see you again. This is <laughs> Gideon. Is. Good to see you, Yes. Nice that you're here. Participants, do you have question? Professor Oren, am I audible to you? Professor Oren? Yes. Uh, this is Gideon. Greetings. Yes. Good to see you. Yes, likewise. Yeah, uh, I have a question uh, um, or a, a, 
a view from you regarding stewardship. Yeah. Um, see, India is a multi-religious country. Yeah. We all know that. And you know, when we have this stewardship responsibility, uh, is that is restricted only to a particular religion? When it is a multi-religious uh, country, so what does can we have? Can we restrict stewardship responsibility only to the Christians? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that your question? Yeah, with multiple religions, I think that the, the most people uh, believe that there was a creator of the world. And uh, in the United States, we have many denominations and religions also, uh, but I think we all believe there is a creator of the world. And if yes. there is something outside of ourselves that did the creation, uh, we should honor the works of that creator, just as we honor the great artworks that people have done. And I know we honor the great engineering works of uh, one of the leaders of the 12th century when they were able to distribute water equally all over uh, many, many, uh, areas of South India so that everybody could grow rice. Uh, that was an incredible feat. And so we honored that person by making a statue of him on a horse, as I recall, uh, with, as we crossed one of the bridges in one of our field trips. Well, uh, a person did that, that's fantastic. But what about a person who created all the creatures and is creating all the creatures of the world and the processes that are, are there? I think we should honor that person uh, with um, taking care of it, which I guess is what stewardship is, taking care of nature, as the dictionary definition said. So I think we're all together in that respect. And I think it's a wonderful, wonderful way to unite people of different uh, ethnic groups, different religions, different cultures. Yes, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Best wishes to you and your family. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. The same way to your family as well. Yes. When are you migrating yeah. again? Right. It's a personal question. When are you migrating again to India? I would love <laughs> to say tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. We're happy. But I will not be, not be coming to India to tomorrow. You we are eager to receive you again. Sorry. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. You're welcome. You're most welcome. Um, thank you very much well, sir, for uh, all your patient answering for our questions. Uh, we were very much enlightened by your talk and the answers which you provided to all our questions. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. We were really transformed and we look forward to practice every little thing which you proposed in your talk. Thank you once again. We are very grateful to you for having spent your very valuable time with us. See you, sir. Well, thank you. You're very kind and generous uh, uh, with your compliments, despite my in inability to uh, hear clearly and understand and uh, be able to uh, carry on. Um, it, I'll be uh, uh, going to sleep soon. And... Uh, we had a traumatic, a traumatic experience today in which all the electricity went out in our region uh, for several hours as I was preparing my final edits of my presentation. And so um, that led to some stress and strain also. But thank you for your generosity and kindness. So we will leave.
गुड मॉर्निंग डॉक्टर भाष्करण सर नाइस सीइंग यू टुडे सर कैन वी स्टार्ट द सेशन नाउ और कैन वी वेट फॉर अ लिटिल टाइम सर आई एम रेडी वी कैन गो अहेड ऑल राइट सर थैंक यू वेरी मच यस वी विल बिगिन थैंक यू अब यू मूविंग ऑन टू स्पेशल एड्रेस फॉर ecology is everybody's work and language has the ability to impact ecology it has the power to sensitize and kindle the spirit of environmental conservation and enable us to vouch a commitment for nature to dwell deep on the topic a language and ecology we have amidst us dr theoda baskarin right and wildlife conservationist to introduce him to the august gathering here comes dr a femila a confident courageous competent head of the department of history it's over to you ma'am we can't hear can't hear respected principal respected dean respected vice principal beloved dean of arts dr shobhana madam associate dean dr shanti madam and respected dignitaries good morning and warm welcome to today's session i take this opportunity to introduce our special resource person dr theodor baskaran sir as a writer historian and wildlife conservation conservationist well known personality he completed his intermediate as in john's college palayam kottai and obtained a ba degree in history from madras christian college baskaran sir worked as research in tamil nadu state archives for two years he joined the indian postal service in 1964 as divisional superintendent at trichy he served as the special officer for war efforts in sri lanka during the indo pakistani war of 1971 he took study leave in 1974 to research tamil film history on a fellowship from council of historical research he eventually retired as the chief postmaster general of tamil nadu He released the Silver Jubilee celebration special cover of Bishop Heber College as the Chief Postmaster General of Tamil Nadu. Baskaran sir published his first article on film in 1972 about Chittanandha Das Gupta's documentary The Dance of Shiva encouraged by his friend Charles a Raisan he decided to do research about Tamil cinema. He joined a film appreciation course in 1974 he became Archives Pune. In 1974, he joined the Calcutta Film Society. The same year, he presented his first research article titled "Film Censorship as an Instrument of Political Control in British India in the Indian History Congress at the Aliha." This and other articles formed the core of his first book, "The Message Barrier," published in 1981. His A second book, The Eye of the Serpent, won the Golden Lotus Award in 1997. He also written several books and articles on film history in Tamil. He was a senior associate in National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. He has lectured on cinema in many universities, including Princeton University, the Australian National University, and the University of Chicago. In 2000 he won the Kiwaja prize awarded by the Kampan Kalagam he often visited the university of michigan in 2001 and taught a course of film studies he was a jury member at the 2003 national film awards during 1998 2001 he was the director of the raja muttayya research library chennai he is a member of the library board of trustee he has also acted in a supporting role in the 2010 tamil film Aval Payer Tamil Arasi. Baskaran Sir is a keen bird watcher and a naturalist. He is the former honorary wildlife warden and the South Indian representative of the International Primitive Protection League. He is the 
trustee of WWF India, his collection of essay on nature and wildlife conservation has been published as The Dance of the Saras in 1999. He edited a book of the articles on natural title, The, uh, Spirit, uh, the Spirit of the Black Bug. He has written several books in Tamil. Malay Kalamum Kuyilo Sayum, Yam Tamilar Say the Padam, Chitiram Pesudadi, Tamil Cinema in Mukangal, Yinum Tiraka the Talemure Kaha, Tamari Putta Tadagam, Vanil Parakum Puliam, Kailirkum Bumi, etc. He believes in creating an environment awareness by writing in Tamil to reach the wider reader. Once again, I welcome you, sir, to this session. Thank you. Thank you very much for those kind words. I want to straight away say how happy I am to be here talking about a topic that's close to my heart. I'm particularly thankful to Dr. Sobhana and Dr. Shanti for organizing this. It's especially significant for me to be at Bishop Peebo College whose growth I have observed with great admiration all these years, more than 50 years. Since we gained independence 74 years ago, there are many things that have improved in our country. Literacy rate, medical care, average lifespan, transport, size of economy, education, and so on. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Is that okay? Can I go ahead? Yes, sir. But there is one area which has been steadily going down over the years in our country. And that is environment, our natural environment. Rivers have gone dry. Water continues to be polluted. We still do not have protected drinking water in our pipes. Forest cover has depleted. Birds like the great Indian bustard and vulture have disappeared from Tamil Nadu. Very difficult to see a fox. Our forests are getting degraded and other sensitive habitats like wetlands and coastal area are getting degraded. The air in our cities and industrial belts is almost unbearable. The capital Delhi has been declared the most, one of the most polluted cities in the world. Now, there are many reasons for this, but today I'd like to focus on one reason, that is the lack of connection between language and our environmental concern. I tell you how I got this insight, how I got this concern. 20 years back, I was living in Madras, and in Madras, you know, there is a river called Adayar, and Adayar estuary is right in the city. Every morning going to office, I'll cross Adair Bridge. And it's a bird sanctuary. Thousands upon thousands of birds is to come to Adair Estuary every winter. And I will see it in the morning. But one morning, it disappeared. Because a boat club nearby deepened the estuary and birds which were feeding in the shallow waters, disappeared. A bird sanctuary that has been in existence for hundreds of years disappeared overnight. Nobody worried. There was not a whimper. There was no news. I began to wonder why. Why are the people not worried about this? Then it occurred to me that the whole discourse on environment and conservation is being carried on in Tamil. 
very limited appeal. We have not realized the connection between language and environment. There is a linguist in Oxford by name David Christen. He has written a wonderful book called The Death of Language. There he says, I quote, the two-way relationship of language to ecology needs to be developed. While discussing ecological issues, languages need to become part of the agenda. End quote. He goes on to say that the language is no longer regarded as peripheral to our grasp of the world we live in. It is central to the issue. Words are not mere vocal labels or communication adjuncts. They are collective products of social interaction, essential instrument through which human beings constitute and articulate their world. Why have we come to this situation in our history? It's because of the colonial rule. Now I'm talking to English. We should normally be talking to Tamil. Our education should be in Tamil, which is the ambient language. This is the price we pay for the colonial rule. I'll explain more about the impact. Whenever a society gets new concerns, its language has to be empowered. There is a new concern, then new words have to come. The new con then only the new concern will grow and flourish. The language has to be equipped to handle this new subject. For example, feminism, LGBT, anti-nuclear movement, human rights, all these are new concerns, also environment. So have we empowered our language, Tamil, to address these new concerns? For example, this anti-nuclear movement is around all over the world. So India is a nuclear power. And there is a big discussion going on. To put the nuclear bomb in a plane and put it on the pointed target of the so-called enemy territory, you have to deliver it. What is the word you will use for deliver in that context in Tamil? We don't have a language, we don't have a, a word, then we don't discuss it. So because the language is not empowered, we do not discuss these issues. A lot of example can be shown from the LGBT issue. But no attention is paid. The government talks that we are all very uh, much fond of Tamil and will improve, but this area has not been taken care of. What do you say for extinction, biodiversity, sustainable capacity, sustainable development, carrying capacity, predation, lots of words related to environment and uh, conservation. So there is a disconnect. But traditionally, we have had a lot of ecological prudence, ecologi ecologically sound practices. We do not even recognize them. See, when people live close to nature, they build up specialized knowledge of aspects of the external world that surrounds them. That is animals, birds, trees, and this knowledge gets uh, distilled and forms words 
it's a it's a package. Uh, when we move away from this language, which is our ambient language, which is the language in which we spoke when we were children, all our ecological wisdom, traditional ecological wisdom, comes through our mother tongue. It is the umbilical cord which connects you to your thousands of thousands of years of tradition. I'll give you an example. In any old civilization, a bird or a mammal is not a mere word. It's a package of natural history information. It's a capsule. It tells you something about the creature. Either its call or its appearance or its habitat. Some names describe the behavior of the creature. The best singing bird in the world is a lyre bird, they say. But the second one is in India. It's a bird called Shama. I have seen the Shama in a place called Kala, you know, near Ruti. I sat there transfixed when I saw that bird in the forest and hear it sing. You know what is its name? Sole body in Tamil. It lives in the Sole and it sings. There are many uh, names like this. I'll just give you a few examples. If a fox that lives in the hole in the warren is called culinary, which has become culinary. And the fox that lives over ground is nari. In I was uh, myself and my wife, we were trekking in Periyar Tiger Reserve, and we had a forest guide, and he showed us a bird and said. This is Kalitartam. That is, that bird has got a red patch in its throat. It's in your compound, in your Bishop Weaver compound. I have seen it. A crimson throated barbet. Okay, how? The appearance gives its name. But we are losing this uh, traditional nomenclature. Not just the names, we are losing the proverbs connected with environment, proverbs which gives uh, ecological insights, ecological uh, uh, conservation ideas. See, we are losing these proverbs. We are losing these names, proverbs, metaphors, because the discourse is being conducted in English. Indian language is rich in metaphor and proverbs. I will give you one example. Nunalum tan vayal kedum. Nunalum tan vayal kedum. If you are teaching it in a class, you will talk about amphibians, tavla. You will talk about wetlands, you will talk about predation. You will talk about behavior. In a small proverb, you can bring in so many issues. Uh, this is the, I quoted David Crystal. You know, he also said, when metaphors die, ideas pass away, and the whole way of thinking is buried. This is one of the consequences of colonial rule. See, the British have done immense work in natural history, no doubt about it. But when it comes to names and names of birds and mammals, they coined names from their point of view. They call this bird Indian robin, which is not a robin, because it looked like the robin in England, so they called it 
it in robin they called a bird which has got nothing to do with the pheasant family as crow pheasant sembut yam krishnan once wrote coat i go who was responsible for calling our gaur wholly unrelated to the bison family the bison it still being used who named the tar of south the nilgiri ibex who coined the misleading name lion tailed monkey for one of the most distinctive macaques the british gentleman sportsman was responsible for all these misnames besides some quite wretched natural history uncoat this uh, lion tailed macaque many of you would have seen it's a very rare animal on the brink of extinction anyone who has been to alpare would have seen it's called sole mandi it's a mandi that lives in sole simple and it explains you the habitat i learned this from a kani in kalakad mundandrai sanctuary the monkey of the rainforest sole mandi monkey there is another black monkey you know it's called nilgiri longer karumandi we inherited these english names from the british and now what we do we translate those english names and use it atrocious you know for example i'll give you the king cobra has been with us for thousands of years and it had a tamil name the tamil name is karunar if you see a king cobra run in the forest you will only see a black streak so it's karunar the british man came he called it king cobra so now we call it rajanar see how it twists the whole thing there are many such names you know that i can uh, give um uh, we have a very rare animal in our forest called alung alung lives on ants and termites i have seen it as a young boy keeping us kept as a pet in some village near polachi alung because it lives on ants the britishers called it ant eater so now we call it yerumbu tinni it's like calling waterfalls you know near which instead of the beautiful word aruvi the use of english words for their translation in place of local language not only fails to communicate to people but it impoverishes the language that is more important than the heritage is being lost names <coughs> excuse me. names that have been in use with us for millennia is being lost now a whole generation is growing up without knowing these words this local nomenclature that's because of english education <coughs> but that's another story i want to travel from vellur uh, to thiruvannamalai by road and i have done similar road trips and i noticed the names of uh, villages now every village has got a name but oh, so much of uh, closeness to nature karivalam vandanallu this is of course thiruvall near tirunelveli puliyu singambunari kodikkanal all related to environment and nature but we have gone far away from uh, nature we have gone far away from this heritage it's our heritage you know just as uh, carnatic music and uh, taj mahal is our heritage these names are our heritage 
In Madras, I once went to a couple of years back to a, a school which had a combined wildlife quiz competition. There were about 1,000 children, all from English medium schools. I was the chief guest, and I found that all of them were English medium schools, and they were answering a wildlife quiz. You see the paradox? People were learning about wildlife from the language of a country where there is no elephant or tiger. Whereas in India, in Tamil Nadu, we have 40 names for elephant, 40 names friends, not 40 different names. Each one means a particular type of elephant, male, female, tusker, male without a tusker, battle elephant, baby elephant, cough, work elephant, ceremonial elephant, temple elephant, each one has got a name. We lost them. We have to we have to redeem them. So also tiger. You know, we have many names for. I was able to get about eight names uh, from our literature. Now you may ask, so what? I'm pointing out that this is one of the many reasons why conservation movement has not become a people's movement in India. Even bird watching as a hobby restricted largely to the English knowing group, you know? It's like playing golf. Uh, but now, fortunately, bird watching is becoming very common and you have clubs in Salem, in Coimbatore, in Tirnal Valley, probably in Tirchi also which is a very good uh, sign, good sign. So what happens when you conduct this discourse in the local language? I'll give two examples. You all know about the Silent Valley movement. It's the flagship environmental movement in India which was successful and prevented the dam coming up in Silent Valley. Why was it successful? The whole discourse was conducted in Malayalam. They didn't go about speaking or writing in English. So the people knew what was happening. A dam is a short term solution, they realized. In Tamil Nadu, a couple of years back, Kundangulam, anti-nuclear movement was conducted. Of course, it was not successful in the sense we didn't prevent it, but it created a people's movement. You know, of all the pollutions in the world, the most dangerous is radiation. Millions die. You know what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But very little is talked about this pollution. And in that Kundangulam agitation, pamphlets were distributed in Tamil. You know, in 1984, when I was in Bangalore, I got a pamphlet, small pamphlet, opposing Kundangulam. Mind you, 1984, it was an idea. The pamphlet titled, so at that time itself, they started writing in Tamil. Now recently, environmental science has been introduced as a subject in schools. I was in that committee for uh, curriculum revision and we introduced a lot of Tamil books. But it was very difficult to get appropriate words in Tamil. And we took part in some teachers' conference. And teachers looked upon environmental science as another subject to be 
given an exam, to be tested in an exam, to be given marks. Environmental awareness on conservation, they are not subjects. They are what our basic life issues, you know, world order. Now, um, if you don't have proper books, you will not be able to teach these uh, subjects uh, at a level in which the children can understand. It is not, as I told you, it's not a subject. I think environmental science, environmental awareness should be like literacy. It is not a subject. I have in my car at the rear wind, window many stickers, save snakes, save birds and all that. One day I was parking my car and one chap came and read it. Or even environmentalist, he said. It's a label. All of us should be environmentalists. It's our lives that we are talking about. It's the air we breathe that we are talking about. It's the water we drink. You know, so it is not a subject. It is a, it has to be like literacy. Everyone should be an environmentalist. But because we have been uh, teaching this in in a language which we are not familiar, you see, we all uh, study in English. My intellectual medium was English in college, not in school. I redeemed my Tamil in my fortieth year. I realized this, and I said, I realized what I was losing. I went back to Tamil in my 40th year and began to write. And since I wrote, since they started writing in Tamil, I don't enjoy writing in English as much. I write an article in Tamil and when I write, I said it's a simple thing, should we write about it? I write in Tamil Hindu. But I write about this and a teacher from Dharmapuri writes it. Sir, I did not know this. It was so uh, enlightening that I read your article. I read your article to my school students, to my class students. He wrote, so satisfying. Because you know, once you talk in that language, they understand. Because we are not, uh, because the discourse is in English, See, we have lost our tradition, ecological prudence, ecological wisdom, our traditional ecological wisdom, we are losing. Buddhism, Jainism, Hinduism, all our traditional religions, of course we talked about Christianity, so I don't go into it. All our traditional uh, religions have a lot of Traditional ecological wisdom. Why are rivers called sacred? Simple. They are life giving. Not only civilization, but life goes on. Buddhism, in Jainism particularly, all lives are sacred. Man is not superior. The Jain heaven is the circle. There are equal parts for all creatures. This is, of course, mythological. The Buddhist Jain, Hinduism, and, see, you know what is the first Indian ecologically environmental server, if you want to call it, or uh, publicity? Ashokan inscription. He said, environment should be saved. You cannot kill an Rhinoceros, he said, in his Ashokan inscriptions. So our ecological prudence comes from that those times. So we have to. 
இஃப் யூ ரீட் சங்கம் லிட்ரேச்சர் புறநானூர் அகநானூர் பரிச்சுப்பத்து அன்பிலீவபிள் விஸ்டம் ஆன் நேச்சர் ஆன் வாட்டர் சோர்சஸ் நீரின்றே அமையால் உலகு சிம்பிள் சென்டென்சஸ் பட் ப்ரொஃபவுண்ட் விஸ்டம் so i think uh, this uh, our whole message of environmental concern should be carried on in our language whatever the language can be malayalam and be kana redeem the traditional nomenclature wisdom you see conrad lorenz many of you would have known nobel laureate biologist one of my favorite writers he said i quote the only way to educate adults about environment is to educate them when they are children unquote so it's a great opportunity to uh, teach them in school concern for environment as i told you should be like literacy but now we have gone further away from nature we have disconnected from nature carl sagan once said we most of us walk through life as if there is no external world tree birds butterflies insects everything surrounds you pura ulag external world it's i mean it's very disturbing to see children getting completely uh disconnected from a natural world we have a young lady at home to help us and she has a daughter 4 or 5 year old lavanya one day lavanya was standing when i was opening the fridge she saw the row of eggs muttai she said ama muttai rendu enna varum theriyuma theriyume omelet she said the kid did not know how she can come so we have lost this connection with the natural world i see it very clearly because i grew up in a village whenever we were not in safe dogs we were in the uh, open air we were in the river or in the uh, bushes you know so we were surrounded by natural world that is getting lost this noun the clature of names is very important in learning about the external world and we have to redeem it now now it's a great advantage the time we live in because of uh, internet and uh, google and facebook number of tamils uh, living in the us are into redeeming these traditional tamil words for environment and conservation and it's amazing how many words are there see if you know tamil well a wildlife researcher will be able to say what were the animals that were there in tamil nadu which are not there now for that you will have to know the name of the animal for example the word karadi is not found in uh, old tamil literature somewhere it is middle it is it's called uliyam so only if you know the word uliyam you will know that oh, there was karadi near pollachi you know so this is how it is very important so in this internet and facebook this tamil enthusiasts we exchange uh, the information that they find there and they so the interaction is very interesting we have a group called tamil bioterms in which we check out names and we get prepare a kind of a glossary for example 
we discuss what is the name for haina tamil haina kaluda puli now they say you know usually tamil original names won't be two words it will be single word vengai kuyil so somebody had a doubt and began to search and now it has been located that the correct word the old word word was kaduvai kaduvai means powerful jaw because the hyena feeds on uh dead animals you know what is left over by tiger and leopard uh it has a very powerful jaws so it's called kaduvai so this uh, has to be brought into uh the day to day parlance but many of these names are still in rural areas you know uh if you ask the fisher folk uh they'll be able to tell you take for example the word dolphin we all we very commonly use this word i have seen dolphin in mahabalipuram coast but what is its tamil word surely before the westerner came the dolphins were there and we were calling it its name is wongi like mungi wongi how did they know i was roaming in the madras museum and there was a glass case with a skeleton of a dolphin mounted in 1930 and it said in tamil wongil elumbukkur and then when i checked with the fisher folk in madras they know they used the word there are many such words not just name but even behavior of animals for each bird call we have a different word quill kuvindru kagam karindru mail aguvindru similarly uh some of the animals are like very close to us kilipilli kiripilli it shows the how close we were with the external world walaikandru you know similarly the behavior of reptiles paambu theendukindru for sting all these are very specific words that gives beauty to the language so when this improves when our understanding of the external world improves then green literature blossoms what is a green literature green literature is literature that's close to nature talks about nature very specific about nature they won't say in pakkathil oru brown paravai vandu utkarndathu no he will say in pakkathil oru vaina vandu utkar or avargal iruvarum oru marathadil nindru pesikondirundargal be specific avar neer pungamara nilayil irundhu pesikondirundar the whole thing becomes very specific that is green literature it's a happy news that we are now having green literature anyone who has read uh perumal murugan his novels punachi please read it it's absolute delight the first tamil novel to be reviewed in 
New York Times. It's all over the world. Poonachi, or Vellatin Kade. All about the natural world. Or So Dharman. You know, So Dharman recently got Sahitya Academy Award. His novel called Kuhe. Kuhe is Andai. Jay Mohan has written this novel called Kadu. All these are green literature that adds to the people's movement. I noticed that uh, our Sangam literature, or even much later, they were so close to the external world. You see, if they say that a man walked from Tiruchi to Tanjavu, they don't say that he just walked. They'll talk about the lake what birds they saw in the lake. And then they talk about the animals he saw and then the poem will end. He reached Tanjavu. So much of observation of the external world. Many uh, situations like uh, Piri is also uh, described in this uh, de by describing the external world. Like our Tinei, yesterday Nirmal talked about Tinei, the Ain the Tinei, fire landscape, incredible uh, observation 2000 years back. Remember, friends, we are all inheritors of that heritage. I'll uh, close my talk by sharing a poem with you. This poem is about a bird called White Stock. I have seen this White Stock not very far from Uyakondan Thirumalai. Then it was only a fields and I lived not far from Bishop Yuga College in a house in Tirchi where I started my career. And one day I went bird watching and I saw one minute, please. Hello, 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 hello. Sorry. <clears throat> and one day I saw this bird near Oyakondal Thirumala. This bird comes from Europe. Every winter it comes to uh, South India, India, right up to the southern extreme of uh, Tamil Nadu. And then it goes back. It's a national bird of Denmark, the white star. Its Tamil name is Sengal Nare. Okay, the poet who wrote this, we do not know his name. You know, many of the poets' names we do not know in Sangam literature. So we call him by his place name. He comes from a village called Satimutra. So he's called Satimutta Pulava. The Satimutta Pulava was in Madurai trying to earn some money. He has come far away from his hometown, Kumbagona. And his wife is waiting for him. No communication those days. You remember, she's waiting in this hut. And the Satimutta Plover sees a small flock of white stock flying overhead in Madurai. And he sings this poem. Narai Narai Sengal Narai Parambudu Panayin Kilangu Bulandana Pavala Kurvai Sengal Narai Niyim Nin Pedayim Tendrise Kumariadi Vadadise Kegavi Rayan Yamur Satimutta Vavil Tangi 
நனைசுவர் கூரை கனைகுரற் பள்ளி பாடு பார்த்திருக்கும் என் மனைவியை கண்டு ஏங்கோன் மாறன் வழுதி கூடலில் ஆடையின்றி வாடையில் மெலிந்து கையது கொண்டு மெய்யது பொத்தி காலது கொண்டு மேலது தழி பேழையில் இருக்கும் பாம்பென உயிர்க்கும் ஏழையாளனை கண்டனும் எனவே தேங்க் யூ வெரி மச் Thanks a ton, uh, Dr. Theodore Baskaran, sir, for the insightful talk. The pang you had while sharing the appearance <laughs> of the 3rd century in Adyar history was felt by us indeed, and all the more when you cited it had not troubled the conscience of the common man. You had enabled us to see that ecological issues should encompass language, it being a major part of the agenda. You highlighting that language needs to be empowered to discuss issues of social and environmental concern touched us indeed. we were inspired by the traditional ecological wisdom richly embedded in our mother tongue um, we were in a when you cited examples of how a bird or a mammal is not a mere word but rather it tells something about the creature a whole generation we understand is growing without the nomenclature and the related basic lifestyle issues associated with it i am sure all of us who listen to you would do our best in this regard It's now time for question and answer session. Dr. Esther Roslin, Assistant Professor of English and Dr. Munis Murthy, Assistant Professor of Tamil will now coordinate the Q&A session. I am a member of the Tamil Nadu. 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 அதே வேளை சூழலியல் சார்ந்து சிந்திக்கக்கூடிய சிந்தனையாளர்கள் தமிழகத்தில் மிக குறைவு அந்த குறைவான ஒரு சிலருள் தாங்களும் ஒருவர் என்பதை நாடறியும் இன்றைய உங்களுடைய உரை தொடர்பாக ஒரு வினா என்னவென்றால் மொழியையும் இலக்கியத்தையும் போற்றக்கூடிய சமூகமானது சூழலியையும் போ சூழலியலையும் போற்றும் என்று நாம் கருதலாமா நிச்சயம் கருதலாம் ஏனென்றால் ஒரு நல்ல இலக்கிய படைப்பு எந்த கருத்தை உங்களுக்கு சொல்லுகின்றதோ அதை நீங்கள் உள்வாங்கிக் கொள்வீர்கள் அந்த படைப்பு சிறந்ததாக இருந்தால் ஒரு பாரதியார் பாடலை எடுத்துக்கொள்ளுங்கள் வானில் பறக்கும் புள்ளலாம் நான் என்று அவர் சொன்னார் அந்த அந்த கவி அழகாக இருப்பதால் அந்த கருத்தை நீங்கள் உள்வாங்குகின்றனர் இதுதான் பசுமை இலக்கியத்தின் பயன் என்று நினைக்கின்றேன் உங்கள் கேள்விக்கு பதில் அது நடக்கும் என்பதுதான் நன்றி ஐயா இறுதியாக உங்களுடைய உரையின் போது கிரீன் லிட்ரேச்சர் என்று சொன்னீர்கள் குறிப்பாக இந்த அடுத்த தலைமுறை மாணவர்கள் இந்த பசுமை இலக்கியம் படிப்பதற்காக அல்லது பசுமை இலக்கம் இலக்கியம் படைப்பதற்காக ஏதேனும் நல்ல ஆலோசனைகள் வழங்குங்கள் ஐயா பசுமை இலக்கியம் படைப்பதற்கு ஆலோசனை அது 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 பதிலளிப்பது சிரமம் ஏனென்றால் முதலில் இலக்கியம் படைக்க வேண்டும் பிறகுதான் பசுமை இலக்கியம் எப்படி இலக்கியம் படைக்க வேண்டும் என்று சொல்வதற்கு எனக்கு தகுதி இல்லை அதை நான் சொல்ல முடியும் தமிழ்நாட்டில் பலர் இருக்கின்றார்கள் இலக்கியம் படைப்பதற்கு அதில் பசுமை இலக்கியம் பலர் அதில் எழுதி கொண்டிருக்கின்றார்கள் சுப்பர் பாரதி மணியன் என்று திருப்பூரில் ஒரு ஒரு எழுத்தாளர் இருக்கின்றார் அவர் சுற்றுச்சூழல் அழிவை பற்றி பல நாவல்கள் எழுதியிருக்கிறார் சாயப்பட்டறை என்ற ஒரு நாவல் எப்படி இந்த சாய தொழிலால் திருப்பூரின் நீர்நிலைகள் மாசுபட்டது என்று சொல்கின்றார் குட் மார்னிங் சார் சார் வாட் இஸ் த ரியல் இன்டென்ஷன் ஆஃப் ஜல்லிக்கட்டு வீர விளையாட்டு சாரி What is the real intention of Jallikattu Veera Vilayattu? Uh, 
ஜல்லிக்கட்டு வாட் இஸ் தோஸ்டின் அபவுட் ஜல்லிக்கட்டு த ரியல் இன்டென்ஷன் ஆஃப் ஜல்லிக்கட்டு ரியல் ரியல் இன்டென்ஷன் ரீசன் சி ஒன்ஸ் பெருமாள் முருகன் வென் டு டெல்லி and uh, there were uh, in a press conference they asked him uh, about jalikat why are you still continuing avaru sonnare enga maadugaloda vilayanda ungalku enna abdin ketar it is a sport it is a uh, oh, அது ஒரு நீங்க தான் சொல்லுங்க ஒரு விளையாட்டு அது ஒரு பாரம்பரியம் உலகத்துல பல இடங்கள்ல அந்த மாதிரி இருக்கு இங்க வந்து கம்பாலான்னு ஒண்ணு இருக்கு கர்நாடகாவில் நான் பெங்களூர்ல இருக்கேன் கம்பாலாவில் எருமை விடுறாங்க ஸோ அதுல த ரியல் இன்டென்ஷன் இஸ் தட் இட்ஸ் அ ஸ்போர்ட் அண்ட் யூ கெட் ஹை ஆன் த ஸ்போர்ட் ஒன் டே யூ கிவ் இம்பார்ட்டன்ஸ் டு தி a livestock uh, that is it and uh, incidentally i am on the pro jalikat lobby okay i i think we should have jalikat bible la kuda irukku sir neethi moligal abingira oru idu irukku probable yerudugal illada idathila kalanjiyam verumayagum abdin oru vasana irukku enna ga எருதுகள் இல்லாத இடத்தில் களஞ்சியங்கள் வெறுமையாகும் அப்படின்னு நான் என்ன எதிர்பார்த்தேன் அப்படின்னா அதோட ரியல் இன்டென்ஷன் வந்து ஜல்லிக்கட்டு த்ரூ த ஜல்லிக்கட்டு ரியல் இன்டென்ஷனா நான் யோசித்தது என்ன அப்படின்னா அந்த பழைய காலத்தோட பழைய காலத்தோட அந்த எருது அதோட வீரியங்கள் இன்னும் இருக்கணும் ஏன்னா நம்மளோட இப்ப நிறைய வந்து புதுசு புதுசா கொண்டு வந்ததெல்லாம் நம்ம என்கரேஜ் பண்ணக்கூடாது அப்படிங்கிறதுக்காக ஜல்லிக்கட்டை நம்ம இன்னும் நம்ம என்கரேஜ் பண்றோம் அப்படின்னு நான் நினைச்சுக்கிட்டேன் சார் அது கரெக்டா அது கரெக்ட் இருக்கு ஒரு பதில் தான் இல்ல பல பதில்கள் இருக்கலாம் நீங்க சொல்றது ஒரு பதில் ரெண்டாவது இந்த இண்டிஜினஸ் பிரீட்ஸ் ஆஃப் கேட்டில் காங்கயம் காளை கிர் காளை பர்கூர் காளை இது எல்லாத்துக்கும் உங்கள் இந்த பொலி காளைகள் ஸ்டட்டு வந்து இந்த ஜல்லிக்கட்டுக்கு வளர்க்குறது தான் அதுவும் இல்லைன்னா உங்களுக்கு அந்த இண்டிஜினஸ் கேட்லே போயிடும் அது ஒரு தமிழர் அடையாளம் அப்படிங்கிறதுல நான் நம்புறேன் அது அழிக்கக்கூடாதுன்னு Good morning, sir. I'm Dr. Esther from the Department of English. We have a few questions in the chat box. The first question, I think, is from an English HOD. She uh, has put it this way. Don't you think, sir, English takes the message of nature conservation, particularly the sensitization drive that happens in a locality at Kudankulam, for instance, or elsewhere, and of course the atrocities that happened on the public later across the globe in these days of wide use of social media but i completely agree with you that conservation mission is effective when done in the vernacular she has put a question in the chat box yeah it's here let me read this sir yeah i i agree with him uh, around the world to get the message around the world we use a language that is uh, uh, that will be understood around the world like english uh, what is his name i do the whoever asked this question i agree with him but i was talking about how you create a people's movement only when you make 
make it into a people's movement, all of us, then conservation can succeed. And for that, you have to use local language. I don't like the word vernacular. This is a word that the British used to downplay your language. Vernacular. English vernacular. You know. Let's use the word Tamil or mother tongue or whatever. Ambient language. Yes, please. Next question. Oh, can, I, can I read this? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, don't you think that English message conservation? Yeah. That's the same question. Yeah. 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 The last, sorry, one Mr. Siddharth Prabhu has asked a question. Can I go ahead? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Could you suggest some research questions regarding Tamil eco novels? This he should ask an academic professor. See, I can't suggest topics. You know, uh, there are a lot of new novels and poem, I mean, like Devadechan poem. Starting from Bharati poem, we have uh, poems that spread green message. You know, so anything that he can choose, either novels or short stories. Yeah. So when we look at the amount of damage that is being done to nature these days, do you think awareness has increased among the people, especially regarding conservation of the environment? And do you find any difference between city dwellers and indigenous groups in conserving nature? You asked two questions. Eh? Can we go one by one? First question, please. First, you think, is there any improvement? Here? Yeah. Do you think environmental awareness has increased among the people? Yeah. I think environmental awareness has been, has increased uh, to a certain extent, but not uh, uh, to the extent that it will affect our lives. For example, take the issue of stray dogs. It's a very big environmental issue. It's a very big pollution, pollutant. But there is a very strong lobby saying that we should feed them. We should be kind to all animals, no doubt. My idea is that all dogs should be owned and taken care of. There should be no, just like there should be no orphans, there yes. should be no stray dogs. Now in the streets, they're spreading death and disease. Forget the uh, traffic accident caused by them. Uh, but there is no awareness of this. I once wrote an article. I, I wrote, I published a book uh, on it, the book of Indian dogs, in which I wrote about this problem. They began to troll me in the social media, you know. So the awareness has not uh, increased to the extent of affecting our lives. Secondly, even as we are talking more about environment, we are losing by the governmental action. Have you been reading what is happening in Lachadiv or in Andaman Nicobar? In Andaman Nicobar, there is a 400 square kilometers sanctuary for saltwater crocodile. You know, we had three crocodiles, three varieties of crocodile in India, saltwater, freshwater, and gharial. 
Now, this uh, saltwater crocodile is the biggest, and we used to have them in our marsh areas. Now we lost them in the mainland, but they are in Andamans. And in 1980, uh, sanctuary was created for it, 400 square kilometer. And last month, it has been reduced to 60 square kilometers. So this is happening side by side. We are losing a lot of uh, protected areas. You know, so the awareness is not adequate, I think. So my next question is, do you see a marked difference the way um, the indigenous groups and the city dwellers look at nature? So who's more conscious? You mean city dwellers are not indigenous? City dwellers are indigenous. You and I are indigenous people. You, so make your question more clear. You're talking about village people. Yeah, I mean the tribals, people who reside more close to... Okay, uh, the Adivasis. Uh, people who live in the forest, tribes. Their uh, understanding of uh, nature is much better than ours. There's no doubt about it. <coughs> For example, <coughs> sorry, you know, much of our wildlife was destroyed by the British after they brought guns and started shooting for trophies. They shot tigers and elephants for trophies. Sagas of Virudh. The indigenous people, forest dwelling people, never shot animals for trophies. They only kill killed for food. Yeah. That too, they'll know the mating season, they'll know the breeding season, they won't kill pigs during breeding season. So, man, human being, was just another predator in the forest, like leopard or tiger. He did not kill for any more than that he needed. Therefore, to answer your question, they are much closer to nature and they live with nature. Their carbon footprint is nil. Their impact is nil. But we have not been kind to them. So ever since we got independence, all our actions have been, you know, detrimental to them. Please see the movie Sharni, which is in Netflix. You will understand more about this. The indigenous people. Gones are there. Yeah, I hope I have answered your question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Do we have uh, any more questions from the audience? You can either post it in the chat box or you can unmute and speak. Uh, I just want to uh, thank you, say a big, big thank you uh, for making this point very, very persuasively and emphatically. I agree with you perfectly that, you know, the thing that I was talking about, Tine, cannot be really carried very far without Tamil language. Without the mother language, I don't think our efforts in this uh, ecological uh, any of these promoting ecological movements, starting them or sustaining them or forming new ones, all of these efforts will be really futile, you know, doing them in some other language. So thank you so much for making that point very, very powerfully. Perfectly thank you, thank you for saying that. You know, I was talking about colonial rule. 
British did a lot of nice things. I won't talk about that. But one of the worst things that they did was they destroyed our self-esteem. They told you sitting on your back that your language is bad, your religion is bad, your uh, lifestyle is bad. And we internalized it. We still think that it is uh, more respectable to speak in English, more respectable to write in English, you know, uh, or to read in English, more respectable. This is one of the worst, um, worst, uh, what is the word, discounting that the British has done. And uh, we are or anything got discounted during our colonial time. Manners. What we think as manners is Western manners, not Indian manners. We forgot in Indian manners. There may be something wrong, that's, that's a different matter. But what we think is manners. For example, there is this idea that in a group of other language people, you should not talk in a language that they do not understand. That is, if there are Westerners in a group, small group, you should not talk in Tamil. Who brought this rule? It's the Westerner who brought this rule because he can't understand it. And we believed it. I realized it only when I started traveling abroad in, uh, when you meet our Indian officers in their embassies or uh, meetings where other nationalities come, the Indian officers will be talking with themselves in their, la their language, in Indian language, Hindi or Bengali, whatever. I can give you many other examples. Like, we will never smoke in the presence of an elder. Okay? It's not done. But in the West, it's done. So in many Indian families, I have seen youngsters lighting up. This is how our psyche has been harmed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, with the permission of the organizers, if I can just make this point, uh, I think um, the uh, long and short of the matter is that the uh, language is not simply a communicating tool, as many of us have come to believe. Every language comes with its own uh, assumptions, uh, with its own cultural baggage from which it can never be separated. So uh, the problem is, you know, a language brings a, a particular universe along with it. And once you are, you know, living in another language and the universe, you know, uh, from which that language emerges, uh, this translation, you know, intercommunication between the two is really a challenge and it's almost impossible to translate some of these experiences. So that is why we need to do, you know, everything in our own language and use another language only for telling somebody about what we are doing in our own lives. Thank you so much. Absolutely, you hit the nail on the head. In the, there are many people who think that language is only for communication. It is for communication, but it's also for so many, so many other things. Uh, once I was asked, uh, what is your first identity in a seminar? I said, my first identity is I'm a, I'm a Tamil, period. The other identities come later because your language gives identity. Jalikati, you talked about Jalikati, it's, it's an identity. As I told you in my own life, I discovered, I discovered Tamil in my 40th year. Though I come from a village, I studied in a school, Tamil school. 
but I went to Madras Christian College and uh, I wanted to uh, join a drama club. So there was a notice, drama club meeting will be at this room. Very enthusiastically, I went there. All of them were speaking in English. Most of them have come from English medium school. So I have come gone from village school. I can understand English. I cannot speak, right? So I, I left that room. You know, that brought this issue to me. When I go, now I don't go to give talks in colleges very much, but earlier I used to. Many colleges, after my retirement, I went and spoke. I make it a point to make the talk simple. They all say that you have to talk in English. It can be a college in Ulundurput, but still they will say you have to speak in uh, English. Okay, you speak in English, 300 students are sitting in front of you, absolutely silent. At the end of it, any questions? No, dead silence. Nobody is asking questions. And then some staff member, just to break the silence, will ask a question. Because they can't form a question in English. You, after that, I'll say, you can ask in Tamil. Then also they won't ask, because then it's infra dig to accept that you cannot form a question in English. This is the situation. You know, so how do you pass on values? You know, I agree with you. Yeah. We have another question in the chat box by Ms. Jesse Daniel. As an eco-feminist, how do you connect women and nature? She's asking your perspective of women and nature. Oh, I should refer this to my daughter, who is a very active feminist. I do not know much about eco -feminism. So I'm not able to answer. I think as a human being, all of us are concerned about this. So, uh, but I know eco-feminists have been writing a lot about this movie that I spoke, Sherini. It's on Netflix, you can see. It's a Hindi movie with English subtitles. My answer will be that it is common to all uh, humans, gender free. But I know there is this subject called eco feminism. I'm, I apologize, I'm not familiar with it. Uh, um, in my PhD thesis, I worked on a particular concept called moral extensionism, which speaks of a nature having an aesthetics of its own and also a moral accountability. So do you believe in it? So when I uh, presented this in my Viva, everybody questioned me. So how do you say that? Um, I stated that nature finds solutions to her own problems. But people, how do you say that nature has morals and aesthetics of its own? So what do you say about this? Sir? It's almost uh, imagining nature as a person. It's a very anthropomorphic view of nature. I don't think nature has got moral values or aesthetic values. That's my answer. No. Okay. If, you, if your religion uh, speaks about uh, nature as uh, having moral, fine, uh, or uh, aesthetics, but I see it as a nature, uh, because, sir, natural. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Nature doesn't encroach into our space, but we do trespass. What do you say? Sorry? Nature doesn't encroach into our space. Sir. Like We are the ones who are doing the deforestation or uh, killing wildlife, endangering species. Yeah, yeah, of course, all over the world, 
not only in India. But I answered you, uh, what uh, my answer was uh, to your question whether the nature has moral values. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think we do not know. We, we cannot say that nature has got moral values. Nature works according to the laws of nature, which is moral free. Yes, sir. Well said. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Thank you very much, sir. It was such a joy listening to you. I really enjoyed and I hope that every one of us learned so many things from your impassioned speech. Thanks a lot once again. Over to the MC Chess. Thanks again, uh, Dr. Theodore Abaskaran, sir, uh, Dr. Esther Roslin, ma'am, and Dr. Munis Murthy for the wonderful session, a memorable one with a lot of take-home messages for all of us. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I enjoyed interacting with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, and uh, an instruction uh, uh, to all the participants, uh, please note that we'll be winding the session now. Uh, the paper presentation, the technical sessions would commence exactly at 1.40 p.m. You can join in your respective links for the same. And uh, please join in this particular link uh, for the uh, final uh, closing ceremony, the valedictory function, which would commence exactly at uh, 3 p.m. So requesting all the participants to join in this particular link at uh, 2.50, 2.55 p.m. Thanks, one and all.